be no doubt whatever that in this instance I did actually hear, although from what direction it proceeded I found it impossible to say, a low and apparently distant but harsh, protracted, and most unusual screaming or grating sound the exact counterpart of what my fancy had already conjured up for the dragon's unnatural shriek as described by the romancer. Oppressed as I certainly was upon the extraordinary coincidence by a thousand conflicting sensations in which wonder and extreme terror were predominant, I still retained sufficient presence of mind to avoid exciting, by an observation, the sensitive nervousness of my companion. He didn't want to upset us. I was by no means certain that he had noticed the sounds in question, although assuredly a strange alteration had, during the last few minutes, taken place in his demeanor. From a position fronting my own, he had gradually brought round his chair so as to sit with his face to the door of the chamber and thus I could but partially perceive his features, although I saw that his lips trembled as if he were murmuring inaudibly. His head had dropped upon his breast, yet I knew that he was not asleep from the wide and rigid opening of the eye as I caught a glance of it in profile. The motion of his body, too, was at variance with this idea, for he rocked from side to side with a gentle yet constant and uniform sway. Having rapidly taken notice of all this, I resumed the narrative of Sir Launcelot, which thus proceeded, and... So, he says, while I'm reading, I swear I start hearing some kind of strange screaming sound. Usher has taken his chair and faced it towards the door. So his back is to the narrator who's reading. And he's sitting in his chair with his arms crossed and his head down, his eyes wide open. He's not sleeping. And he starts muttering to himself and rocking back and forth like this. And the narrator says, I don't know. I guess I'll just keep reading. Again, the reader of this, of this story will go, are you serious with me? I think at this point, it might be time for you to try and get out of the crazy mansion, the crazy haunted house, right? Notice, he will keep reading, and as he reads the story about Lancelot and the dragon, something very strange happens. Now, the champion, having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon, last paragraph, 308, of the brazen shield, and of the breaking up of the enchantment which was upon it, removed the carcass from out of the way before him, and approached valorously over the silver pavement of the castle to where the shield was upon the wall, which in sooth tarried not for his full coming, but fell down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty great and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had these syllables passed my lips than, as if a shield of brass had indeed, at the moment, fallen heavily upon a floor of silver, I became aware of a distinct, hollow, metallic, and clangorous, yet apparently muffled reverberation. The sounds are getting louder. Completely unnerved, I leaped to my feet, but the measured rocking movement of Usher was undisturbed. I rushed to the chair in which he sat. His eyes were bent fixedly before him, and throughout his whole countenance there reigned a stony rigidity. But as I placed my hand upon his shoulder, there came a strong shudder over his whole person. A sickly smile quivered about his lips, and I saw that he spoke in a low, hurried, and gibbering murmur, as if unconscious of my presence. Bending closely over him, I at length drank in the hideous import of his words. Here's what he's muttering. Not hear it. Yes, I hear it and have heard it. Long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it, yet I dared not. Oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Said I not that my senses were acute? I now tell you that I heard her first feeble movement in the hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago, yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred, 
<laughs> the breaking of the hermit's door, and the death cry of the dragon, and the clangor of the shield. Say, rather, the rending of her coffin, and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison, and her struggles within the covered archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footstep on the stair? Do I not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Man, man! Here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables as if in the effort he were giving up his soul. I tell you that she now stands without the door. So this is an interesting passage. Notice Poe's ability with dialogue. If you're going to read the story out loud, as our professional reader is doing, you almost have to read it the way he read it because of the words that he's speaking. What is it that he's saying? In a line, baby sister Madeline wasn't dead when we buried her. She's been laying in that coffin, and she's finally decided to come out of the coffin, and she's coming to get us. More particularly, she's coming to get me. I think she's right outside of our door. She's there right now. So we have the convergence of all of your zombie films, of all of your scary ghost story films. Of course, everything now will, no pun intended, hinge on that door, and what happens Next, the final paragraphs of the story. Here we go. As if in the superhuman energy of his utterance there had been found the potency of a spell, the huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the work of the rushing gust, but then, without those doors, there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes, and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment, she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold, then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother, and in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. You think? The he says I ran away. The <laughs> in all its wrath as I found myself crossing the old causeway. Suddenly there shot along the path a wild light and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued. For the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full Top of three ten. red moon, which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure of which I have spoken before as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting sound, like the voice of a thousand waters, and the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. Whoa! So, sure enough, when the door flies open, Madeline is standing there, Describe at level one what she looks like. What does Poe focus on? She's still in her shroud she was buried in, but now it's covered in blood. Her whole body looks like it's been beat up really bad because she's been working to get out of her coffin. And then she falls into him, and she dies, and immediately he dies. The narrator then says, Adios amigo, I am out of this house. And so he runs down, jumps on his pony, and as he is riding his horse away, he looks back and the entire area is lit up with a bright light. And then that crack that he saw 
down the middle of the house, that fissure begins to open and then the house sinks down into the tart, into the ground and is, and is covered up. The fall of the house of Usher. The end of the story. Wow. Let's make a couple of quick observations about really one of the genius writers of horror gothic fiction and of course probably his classic story of the haunted house. I told you at the beginning of this session that we wanted to concentrate it to be on conflict. So let's take a look now and think a little about the ways in which Poe is playing the game with the reader of conflict. The question that never gets resolved, write that question down for you. What is the question that never gets resolved for you, the reader? You're never actually sure about what? Right. You're never totally sure what is wrong with this Usher house and the family that lives inside of it. Why is this such a screwed up place? The narrator gives us no insight to this at all, which begs the obvious question, what is the central conflict? Again, some readers will focus on the idea, this is an internal struggle between Usher and his own mind, right? Some have read this story as the penultimate example of character versus nature and the forces of nature in the end the house swallowed up into the very ground it once stood upon, right? Of course, you could say this is a story about how one loses one's mind or goes insane. One of the obvious questions is, why would a guy write a story like this? Let's jump to 2A real quickly. Some possible messages from a story like this. You could make the argument that you could read this story as nothing more than simply gothic entertainment. For the same reasons that people go to scary movies, we like to be scared. But why do we like to be scared? In a famous essay, Stephen King points out, it is the human condition to drive by a terrible accident where there's terrible things to be seen, and we tell ourselves not to look, but our curiosity forces us to look. We are inquisitive and we want to know things, and so we look. You could make the argument that Poe has caught on to this idea rather well with the human psyche. You want to keep reading even though you know it's going to kind of freak you out, right? Part of the themes, potential messages of our story also have to do with the idea of relationships. Notice that our narrator has a relationship with Usher and he recognizes there's something wrong with Usher but he doesn't know what to do to fix it. And so he just kind of hangs around. We become in some ways like the people we associate with. He begins to himself start to have some of the same mannerisms of Usher himself. And then at the end, he has to get out. He has to escape. A final message, of course, is that uh, a divided house must fall. Sooner or later, it, you know, uh, problems are going to implode a situation, right? And the only escape is to escape to get on your pony, and to ride away. Level 3. We've already mentioned it a number of times at 3A. It's pretty simple, isn't it, to try and think about scary stories, scary films. Who was for you at 3B? Um, well, we'll now turn there. Who was for you the great scary storyteller of your life? Can you write down a name, for example, at 3B? of a person who when you were younger could tell a story that could just freak you out but you liked it anyway. Are you a good storyteller of scary? Are you a good storyteller that kind of can make people want to listen? Poe is the great storyteller that makes you want to keep reading to know what exactly is it that's going to happen next. Do you think it's part of the human condition to want to be scared? Do we like it? Freud argued that fear is one of the inherent kinds of levels of anxiety, roots of anxiety, that predominate all of our life from the time we are children to the time we become quite old. Jot down in your notes, what is for you the scariest thing for you? Is it something that can happen immediately? 
Is it something that you worry about in your future? Many will argue that the penultimate scary fear is the fear of death and dying. What is that fear for you? And how do you deal with that fear? Well, there you go. An introduction to Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher. Amazing storytelling. Thank you.